in chapters 9 and 10, which we've most recently discussed in the adult class, Paul expressed his concern for his nation, for Israel. He reached in his writings several conclusions about their past behaviors and motives. But he still has hope for Israel. As it relates to their relationship with God and ultimately their salvation. Verse 1 of chapter 11. And I might mention that I read from the New King James Version. I say then, has God cast away his people? In this 11th chapter, just like the previous, Paul, led by the Spirit, asks questions and then helps the reader understand the conclusion. Has God cast away his people? Certainly not. No, they're not cast away. In times past, Israel has been judged by God for their idolatry, for their misbehavior, if you will. But cast away here doesn't have the idea of permanency, not forever. God, in his reprimanding or judging the nation, in his punishment, if you will, has always made provisions for the nation to return. But it's been conditional. It's based upon their behavior. Repentance. Changing of their ways. Which I think most of us here realize when you repent, there's an outward action because you changed your mind. Your heart changed. Uh, Your attitude changed about your past behavior. So God has always made provisions for Israel. And in the text here, Paul's saying that they're cast away in a sense. So judgment might be termed or categorized as a form of casting away. But here I think he has the idea of it's not permanent. In Psalms chapter 94 and verse 14 For the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. I think forsake there is the idea of permanency. Forever. But rejection? Forever? He won't do that. And there's a reason. Because there's a promise. Uh, Israel needs to make it, uh, my word, they need to survive, they need to exist for the fulfillment of the promises. Um, Isaiah in chapter 49 and verse 15 puts it this way. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she is born? When you read that, it sounds like he's implying No, she can't forget. She can't withhold compassion for the child she has born. But in the next part of it, Isaiah says, though she may forget. Yeah, so it's possible for the mother to forget the child she nursed and bore and reared. It's possible. But Isaiah speaking here, of Israel says, I will not forget you. So I think this forget is different than forsaken, like forever. I think I will not forget you is like, is Israel cast away? No, certainly not. Though they've been judged, though they've been punished, you know, their past behavior Got them sent into captivity. They lost the land. We we know from past studies that 
when they returned, there were some that didn't come back. They chose to just stay where they were. So here, not forever, not permanently, not until God has made every attempt to restore them. Not until His plan comes to fruition. You might think, why? Israel, after all they've done? 2 Peter 3 and 15 says, And consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. It's not an automatic salvation. You know, God is long-suffering with us, but that doesn't automatically guarantee that we'll have salvation. But an opportunity. And I think possibly that's what's being discussed here. Cast off? No. No. Certainly not. But a chance to do it again. A chance to do better. A chance to get it right. A chance to obey and repent. Because wrongdoing will always be judged by God. In Numbers chapter 14 verse 18. But he will by no means clear the guilty. If I'm guilty, if you're guilty... We'll answer. And so will Israel. He is a gracious and loving and forgiving God to a point. But it's for a purpose. We've discussed recently here in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 in the latter part of that. There's a reason for the cast off. There's a reason for the judgment, the punishment, if you will. In the B part of that, I'll read the whole verse. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? His long suffering, his forbearance, his goodness, some versions say kindness. It's there for a purpose. It says to lead you to repentance. That's Israel then and now and us. So Israel, and I would argue or suggest on a permanent basis, no, they're not cast off. And he has a reason for this in the B part of verse 1. For I am also an Israelite. If you say that Israel's cast off and there's no hope for them, and the Jews rejected the Christ, the Messiah, and killed him, so Israel's doomed, well, then Paul would be doomed. But he said, I also am an Israelite. He's not a proselyte. Remember proselytes in the old Bible? A person that converts. Uh, By definition, a person that converts from one opinion or religion or party to another. They're a convert. Some ideas have it as a stranger or a newcomer. Paul's not a newcomer to Israel. He's not a convert to Judaism. He's born in it. He said, I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul's a Benjamite. So, the people, though cast off, though rejected, though the gospel went on to the Gentiles, they're not cast off forever. Verse 2. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel? Remember, Israel are God's people. 
Genesis chapter 17, verse 8, in the latter part of that, the B part, is where God, and I'm sure someone will check me on this, it's the first place that I recall where God says, I will be their God. And then again in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 7, then I will take you for my people. I think those are possibly the occasions when those first declarations were made. I will be their God and I will take them. I will take you for my people. Personal, possessive. God foreknew Israel and he and his purpose to take them as a possession. It's personal with him. The idea of foreknew is something we're probably not familiar with. Foreknew has the idea of almost like foreloved. For, uh, foreknew is the one he said is delight upon. He regarded them with affection. One writer I read from said it wouldn't it wouldn't change the meaning if we suggested the idea of for love. He loved them. He took delight in them. He regarded them, and we know what he did. He took them for his people, for my people. Him speaking. These same people. Elijah made an accusation against them. And that's what's being discussed here in the second part, the latter part of verse 2. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? That reading comes from 1 Kings chapter 19. You might turn there if you like. In 1 Kings 19, it's the idea of, or it's the incident where Elijah was on the run, fearing for his life. Jezebel, the queen, was trying to kill him. He's in a bad place. In verse 10, this is Elijah speaking. I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. In this reading here, if you'll study it further, Elijah wanted to die. He asked the Lord to take him. But what we're reminded of when we finish reading this chapter is God had reserved 7,000 who had not bowed the knee to Baal. Though Elijah felt like he was alone, he wasn't. If you took this verse and you applied it to yourself, what would you say? If you were to answer honestly, what would you say about yourself if you wanted to convince someone that God was still working in your life? We know what happened with Elijah. He went 40 days on this cake that an angel baked him and a jar of water. We know that Paul says, I too am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham. We see how God's working in both of their lives. How patient and how long-suffering. How much goodness has God shown towards me and you? We sing a song, Count Your Blessings. But I'm asking you to think about the degree of forbearance that God showed us. God is still working 
through the gospel, through this plan of salvation, and showing his loving kindness, his forbearance, his goodness to all of us. Just like he did Elijah and just like he did Paul. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says he showed his love towards us. But when? Verse 8, Romans 5, but God demonstrates his own love. Remember, my people, this is his own love. This is his love towards us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's when the forbearance began, when we were sinners. But now, things are changing for the Israelites. And as we hear the gospel, we have to come to some conclusions. We have to decide if we're going to answer. Because these times of ignorance that God winced at or winked at, that he overlooked, Acts 17 and verse 30, he now commands all men everywhere to repent. Israel then, and the Greeks, everybody that was non-Jews, Israel now, and us. All men everywhere repent. A remnant was promised, and a remnant has been delivered, if you will. It's been preserved. And it's because he foreknew these people, he took them for his own, and he made a promise to them. Verse 3 was Isaiah's uh, charge against them Lord, they have killed your prophets torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so, at this time, at Paul's time, there's a remnant, Israelites, that remain according to the election of grace. Times then were no different than times now. Did God need Israel then? Does he need us now? He'll accomplish his will with you or without you. With me, or without me. His word will not return to him void. His will will be accomplished. I thought about that in thinking about Isaiah. Excuse me, in thinking about Elijah. Elijah thought he was the last one. If he was, and we know he wasn't, it wouldn't have mattered. God can accomplish his will with or without man. Acts chapter 17 again, verse 25, speaking of God says, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. We're talking here in the context of Romans 9, 10, 11, and 12 about the law compared to the gospel, about works versus grace. He doesn't need anything from us. He desires obedience. He desires a change of heart from us and them. But he doesn't need anything. I'm thinking about Gideon in Judges chapter 7. Gideon there started out with 32,000. What a nice fighting force. And they were dismissed. 
the ones that were fearful and didn't really want to go, they were allowed to go home and 22,000 left. And then God said, it's still too big a force. We need to weed it down and narrow it down. And they narrowed it down by seeing how men drank to 300. And it was so that God would get the glory, get the recognition for the victory. He didn't really need 300. How about the times... And it's an interesting look at the times that the hornet, not a man, not an army, not a battalion, not commanders with spears and bows and chariots. The Lord said hornets. And I'm suggesting if the Lord chose to, he could have won every battle with Israel and their enemies without a man ever drawing a sword. Joshua 24 and verse 12. Not with your sword or bow. Not by your hand. By God's will. And so, our salvation, it's accomplished because God's forbearing with us. It's not anything we can do. He accomplished Think about this. God accomplished and restored man to the proper relationship with him by one man. One man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. The man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom, for all to be testified in due time. You think about all the works of the law, all of those animals that got killed and their blood was shed and they were sacrificed in the priesthood and all. It was laborious. I mean, it was a lot of work. But in the end, one man accomplished God's plan. And it's by Him that we can be reconciled to God, put back in this proper relationship. Verse 5 talks about the remnant existing, exist in Paul's day. He says it's preserved according to the election of grace. He argues in verse 6, if by grace, in essence, it can't be by works. If by works, it can't be by grace. That's the supposed argument. It's the argument Paul's suggesting. It seems like a paradox, like, well, which way's right? But it's really not a paradox. What had God always sought from Israel? I'm in chapter 9 of Romans, a couple pages back, verse 32. The question is why? Um, I like the way the Spirit led Paul through these chapters. He's, he's trying to get this Gentile church in Rome to understand all of this. And he proposes questions and then gives the answer. So it's not ambiguous. It's The answer is in the text. And talking about Israel, Israel is the subject in verse 32. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith. That's what God always wanted from Israel. Is He wanted them to obey Him, to love Him. Just do what He says. But they stumbled by the works of the law. It was their 
They just kept tripping over themselves and their self-importance. Remember chapter 10 and verse 3? For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So it really can be things we do and grace, the free gift that comes from God. Um, I told ER I wouldn't bring it up, but I, I'm going to. I enjoyed his class Wednesday night because he talked a lot about obeying the gospel and baptism. At the end of class last week, we were talking about conclusions. 1 Peter 3.21, the answer of a good conscience, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience to God. This baptism that saves us, well, it's something you have to do. It's a work. It's an act of obedience. But the whole plan came by grace because God loved us. What is grace? Uh, I've always liked that real small def definition. Unmerited favor. Butch, RJ, myself, Shane, we didn't do anything deserve this unmerited it's not on merit this is not the merit system God because he was long suffering and forbearing with mankind extended this grace but the thing we have to do is of works we have to do something we have to obey Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. I, I try and break things down simple. And this is a quite simple verse. Uh, I think sometimes it has to be simple for me to get it. Grace is the gift of God. There's no doubt about it. It's a free gift. It's unmerited. We did nothing to deserve it. But the verse also talks about faith. And that's our part. The gift of grace came from God, but the faith goes that way. God can't have faith. The faith has to come from us. The grace comes from Him, the faith from us. Faith is the idea of complete trust in someone or something. It's confidence. It can't come from God. Does he have any confidence in us? It has to be going the direction from us to him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's a good description from the Hebrew writer. In Hebrews 11, verse 8, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called. By faith, Abraham offered Isaac. See, the faith goes that way. The faith is a projection upward. It's something we have to do. It's an act. It's obedience. Verse 6, And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Remember here, he's arguing for the gospel. The power of God to salvation. Not the old law. We've discussed that that's been done away with. It's been nailed to the cross. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, works, excuse me, otherwise work is no longer work. So there, grace extended to us by God compared to the works of the law. Verse 7, 
a question. What then? What are you saying? Or so you're saying Israel has not obtained? Well, they've been cast off. The gospel went to the Gentiles. So Israel, who received the promises and had the law, and they were seeking righteousness, they didn't obtain it. But the elect obtained it, and the rest were blinded? I think yes. The answer is yes. Some Israelites received it, but the majority were blinded. Who are the elect here? I think the elect are probably the same group of people that are the first fruit in verse 16. The elect are those who obey the gospel. The elect are those who seek righteousness by faith. Remember 9 and verse 34? Because they didn't seek it by faith. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 11. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? But he answered and said, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Some were blinded and given this Spirit of stupor. It's talked about from verse 14 of Matthew, verse 14 and 15, and it's talked about here in Romans chapter 11, a spirit of stupor. Uh, what is a stupor? I think for the purpose of understanding this, they're spiritually numb. They're dead. There's some that can't be retrieved. Some will be obedient. Remember, Jesus had Jewish followers. We know those that obeyed on Pentecost were mostly of the nation of Israel. So there's some that would follow. But in general, they're just numb. They can't really face reality. You remember in John chapter 8, verse 33, Jesus was talking to them, and these were believers of him. It's interesting. They were believers, and they turned on him uh, really quick. John chapter 8, verse 33. Verse 31, then Jesus said to those Jews, who believed him. These are Jews. They believe what he's saying. If you abide in my word, you are my disciple indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And what was their answer? They answered and said, we're Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. I know we've made the point in the adult class before. While they were speaking these words, they were under Roman rule. I mean, they're, they're not even being realistic in the things they say. They won't admit the truth. That's kind of the idea of stupor. So these believers turned on him because they didn't like what he said. They didn't want to believe the truth that he spoke. And, and he goes on in the rest of that chapter. So some will hear, but they really won't hear. Here as in understanding. 
and they will not see as in seeing and understanding. Their back will always be bowed in bondage because of unbelief. I think here in Romans 11, that's what the idea is. They'll be in bondage to sin because they'll be, uh, their back will be bowed down. It's because of unbelief, because they didn't understand that God wanted them to serve him by faith. Verse 11 is another question. I say then, concluding what we've discussed so far, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? There seems to be a difference here between stumbling, as described, and falling. This is an easy question for the audience. Who hasn't stumbled? And I'm talking about walking. We've all stumbled. A child, when he learns to walk, goes from crawling to pulling up, and then they get brave and they let go. Well, they immediately, almost immediately go splat. Everybody understands that. But there are more severe falls. There's a fall you can take. There's a tumble you can take. And it might kill you. You might hit your head and you might not get up. You might have broken bones. That's a serious stumble and a fall. And I think the comparison is what he's making here. He's trying to get them to understand Israel stumbled. Remember, the law was their stumbling block. They couldn't get past it. They kept tripping over themselves and their importance. Here, Abraham's seed had never been in bondage. So they have stumbled, but did they fall? As a nation, yes, but not a death blow. Paul argued that he's evidence of that. I'm an Israelite, seed of Abraham, tribe of Benjamin. Oh, Israel stumbled. There's no doubt about it. It's definitely a stumble. But not a death stumble, not a death blow. They're not cast away forever. They're not cut off forever. Because these are times of restoration. God is trying to reconcile man to himself. Israel may be, they may deserve be cast off forever by their actions. And it's easy for us. I've looked back at them and I'm thinking, wow, are you serious? You really acted that way? What would they do? What would the Israelites, the righteous, what would Joshua and Caleb, the only two that were allowed entrance into the land because they were were upright, what would they say about you and me? Would they look at me and go, are you serious? Are you serious, Tim? After what God did for you? Let's not be quick to point the finger at Israel and say, yeah, they they really deserve the death blow without considering yourself. If you think of it in those terms, it, it might cause you to be humble and check yourself to see if you're in the faith. Even in that condition, Romans 5, 8, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Even in the state where we're condemned, Christ died for us. John chapter 15 Verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, 
than to lay down one's life for his friends. God required something for what I did and what you did and what mankind did, and he provided what he required. And we've talked about that. Christ died for all. We're all guilty. We're all like Israel. Romans 3 and 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. See that word in there, fall? Has Israel fallen? Yeah, they stumbled. But they're not cast off. All, Israel and us, we've fallen short. We fail spiritually. And we can't reach. We're short. We can't reach the glory of God. We can't attain what is necessary for salvation without the man Christ Jesus. The, the fall depicted in Romans 3 is coming up short of God's glory. In essence, we in Israel and all of mankind, we don't measure up. We can't measure up without Christ. That's where grace comes in. That unmerited favor. We've done nothing to deserve it. We'll pick up again next week in verse 11 of Romans chapter 11. Before we close the class, I might ask if any man has a comment or question. We're going to be led in singing by Philip.